Number 5. The Great Controversy, Second Quarter, 2024. John Pauline. Hello, Pineau family. We're about to embark on Lesson 5 of the Great Controversy series, but today's lesson, Lesson 5, is Faith Against All Odds. Before we begin, Livius is going to offer our prayer. Thank you, Lord, for creating a space for us to investigate and look into your wonderful character. Be with Dr. Pauline as he leads our discussion today. Also, be with each one here and those listening. Immerse us, Lord, in your Holy Spirit and humble our hearts so we may receive his counsel, so that we might reflect and glorify your name in our discussion today. I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So this is the fifth in a series of studies on the Great Controversy, following the book, The Great Controversy, by Ellen G. White, and seeking to draw out spiritual implications from various aspects of history. Great Controversy is sort of an outline of Christian history, drawing some implications for today and so forth. As it points out in number one, The historical focus of this lesson is on the great reformers, Luther and Zwingli, up to the famous protest of the princes. So the dates we're looking at here are 1517 to 1530 is the dates in history that this is covering. So clearly the period of the great reformers, as some would call them, is crucial to Ellen White's understanding of the whole history that the book Great Controversy addresses. The lesson notes that since the reformers had a message they felt was worth dying for, it would also be a message worth living for. So the lesson explores biblical passages related to the scriptures, which are at the heart of developments described in these chapters of great controversy. So what we'll do at the beginning in number two is read a number of psalms that you see listed there and respond to the question, what was David's attitude toward God's word, and how did this impact the Reformers, and what impact might it have on us today? So, Terry, if you would open to Psalm 119. As you all know, it's by far the longest chapter in the Bible, and we'll start with verse 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. All right. So David truly, genuinely appreciates God's word, saying it is sweet to my taste. So in other words, a study of the scriptures was something that was delightful to him. It wasn't a chore, and he delighted in it. And he found the scriptures would build his understanding. Verse 147. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I put my hope in your words. All right. So he directs himself to the word when he has questions, when he has problems, when he has things that he can't handle. So the Bible provides the answer to his questions, provides rescue when he's in trouble. It brings him hope. Verse 162. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. All right. So it's kind of like winning the lottery. (laughs) Studying the Bible brings great and sometimes surprising rewards that come with it. In saying that, I just thought I'd quickly mention that the Bible has a lot to say about joy. It doesn't have a lot to say about fun. And I think for many people today, those two words get confused. Joy and fun sound like two ways of saying the same thing, but they are quite different. Fun is a very present tense kind of thing. You're having fun you know, when you're playing a game. You're having fun when you go to a concert. You're having fun when you're listening to music, etc. But when the object of that fun or the subject of that fun ends, the fun ends with it. And the beauty of joy, you can have joy in suffering doesn't mean the suffering is fun. No way is it fun. But joy transcends the present tense. A joy is something that is lasting, and you can have joy through the ups and downs. So I think when we read the Psalms, keeping that in mind, you know, some people say, you know, how can you find joy in suffering? Well, 
If you mean fun, no, you're not finding that. But joy is something that is bigger than the immediate situation that carries through. So we see David's attitude was, for him, the word was the most amazing and central thing. Now, what is the difference between devotional reading of the Bible and exegesis? And what are some of the benefits and limitations of both approaches to the Bible? So if you're going to enjoy the Bible, how are you going to read it? You know, one option is devotional reading. Another option is exegetical reading, you know, studious intellectual reading. How do you go about that? How do you distinguish those? Larry? Your statement about David going to the Bible, to God's word for answers. And we oftentimes make light of people who like will open up the Bible and say, I'm looking for an answer and whatever it says here, that's going to be the answer to what I'm looking for. But I think out of all of the background reading that has gone on through Ellen White for this series of lessons, she keeps making the statement fairly clear that the Bible is a way of raising a person's intellect, enabling them to think different. So what hit me when you said that was I find in my own life at this point that reading the Bible, I will oftentimes get insight to other things going on if I'm just having a perplexing day and I sit down and just take a few minutes and then relax with that. It is the idea of going to the Bible for an answer, but I don't actually read it for the specific understanding of that what I'm going to read is related to what I'm looking at, if I said that correctly. Well, the Bible's a fairly large collection, and that means if you're going to the Bible for answers, you'd better have a long history with the Bible. In other words, the better you know the Bible, the more likely it is that you might find a specific answer at a specific time. But if you're just sort of opening the Bible and throwing darts, don't expect to find many answers in that way. So an incentive, perhaps, for studying the Bible is recognizing it's an investment. When you're investing money, you're taking away money from the present and investing it in the future. In other words, that's money you can't spend now. But if you don't invest money, it won't grow. And if you spend it all, you'll have nothing left until tomorrow and the next check, and then maybe you'll do it again. So investing means depriving yourself of something now in the hope of gain later on. And I like to think in those terms when it comes to the Bible. Not every time you pick up the Bible are you going to have a thrilling, life-changing experience. Sometimes it's downright drudgery. If you've never done Greek and Hebrew, there can be a lot of drudgery when you get into languages like that. But you're making an investment. You're building up a knowledge base. You're building up an understanding base. The Bible's coming together in your mind. And the end result is that when you do need answers, there's a higher chance that you might actually be able to find them because you have a sense of what that body of evidence is that you're looking at. So something to keep in mind in all of that. All right, Michael. I have a question. Actually, it's two questions. One is, when was the Old Testament canon first written, or was it a collection of writings that was slowly put together? And then the other is, how was the canon settled, the Old Testament canon settled? Okay. Yes, the Old Testament canon, if you take a conservative position, in other words, taking the Bible itself seriously as evidence for the construction of the canon, most people would go all the way back to Moses as being the primary author of the first five books of the Bible. And then what we call the Old Testament would have been written over about a thousand years, ending with Malachi, who's around 425 BC. So from 1450 or so, Moses' time to 425, over that thousand years, the Bible would have been written. But books continue to be written after Malachi. You have Maccabees, for example. You have Second Esdras and additions to Esther and so forth. So there were other books that were written, First Enoch, Second Baruch, etc. So a lot of books were written, but I think in the end, I think the decisive thing was that all the books of the Old Testament were written in Hebrew, and the intertestamental books generally were written in Greek. And so it seems that the fact that they were not in Hebrew it may have been part of leaving them out of the canon. And the canon was open 
I would say, until shortly after the destruction of Jerusalem. Most scholars would put the date around 90. When you have the Old Testament canon, as we currently know it, was announced, and it didn't change much after that. So that's the Old Testament, probably some 25, 30 authors over a thousand years documenting God's actions with Israel over that period of time. I think most of those books were seen as from God, as special all through that, but the idea of a canon. I think in part, the canon almost required the codex, another little piece of history. The primary method of book storage before the New Testament times was the scroll, when you'd write on long sheets of paper and then roll them up to store them. The codex is what we think of as a book, you know, like what I hold in my hand here. The codex is where you have sheets stacked on each other and then glued at the edge so that they can come together. Scrolls had limits. They could only get so big. And for example, Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls was two scrolls, one to 33, I think, and 34 to 66 of the chapters. So it took two whole scrolls to cover the book of Isaiah. So obviously, you wouldn't hold an Old Testament in your hands. So it was the codex that enabled things to be much more compact. And my suspicion is that the codex may have been an invention if not of some of the New Testament writers or within the Christian context, with the desire to be able to have all four Gospels and all the letters of Paul all connected together. Once you have a codex, then the scriptures are more portable, etc. So the Old Testament canon was kind of settled around 90 AD, and in the New Testament, somewhere in the fourth century. Sean? Yes, thank you very much for that background. I have a question about your interest for us to consider devotional reading or exegetical reading. I have a question as to how do we look at the context of the writing, the author, and their intent and use for their authorship and writing? How do we approach understanding when and how they were using the writings for devotion and or exegesis. Is there a way to determine, or is that even an important question to ask? Is David reflecting upon a point of inspiration and or writing that he may be referencing as devotion or exegesis? Mm -hmm. Is that an important question? Oh, I think it is. It's one that scholars wrestle with all the time. Did the New Testament writers take the Old Testament out of context? Were they treating Isaiah in context? Etc. I think the general assumption is no. Exegesis, and this may disappoint some of you, but exegesis as we know it is a fairly recent thing, probably in the last hundred years or so. And where did it arise? It arose from the fact that while all Protestant churches were grounded in the scriptures, there were hundreds of different variations of denomination, of beliefs, etc., all drawn from the same Bible. So the value of looking to a church hierarchy for your understanding is that you have one understanding, right or wrong, (laughs) you see. And of course, the Reformation rejected that because they said, well, it's wrong on so many points. We need to start all over. But in doing that, it resulted in tremendous fragmentation as well. So as scholars saw that it was more and more difficult for people to agree, they saw that the church was divided. And they said, is there some way that we can bring sense to all this? Is there some way that the scriptures can be handled more responsibly than we have in the past? And that is where exegesis came from, asking the question, what was the original writer trying to say in the original situation? That was the crucial distinction. As I said, it's probably only in the last hundred years that those kind of questions were asked of the scriptures. I remember scholar Stephen Moyes, an Anglican scholar, was a visiting professor for a few weeks at Andrews University at at my invitation, or actually it was his invitation. He wanted to do it, and I got the agreement to folk at Andrews to allow that to happen. Went all the way up to the president and the board, I guess. But Moyes came, and he was just wonderful. He blended in so well. He preached at chapel and other things, uh, just fit right in. But the one thing I'll never forget 
He says devotional reading is appropriate. Devotional reading should be encouraged. But when the church is divided, it must do exegesis. When the church is divided, it must do exegesis. So devotional readings are what I would say is truth for me. I go before God in the morning and I say, Lord, I need a word from you today. Be with me as I read this biblical text. And the Holy Spirit can touch base with any turn of phrase, any sentence, even single words, and just suddenly stop you in your tracks. And you have an insight that's straight from God for you. The problem with devotional readings is no one else can follow them. What you just saw in the text is not something anybody else might see, but that the Holy Spirit used the text to point something out. But when you as a devotional reader go and tell the rest of the church, hey, you guys got to do this and that, because that's what the text says to me. That's not usually going to fly very well unless you have a lot of power and force and intimidation behind you. So when the church is divided, it must lean on exegesis to make sure that we're all looking at the same text that we're all seeing the same thing and then weighing it at that. So exegesis is truth for everybody. Seeking to understand the original context of the original author as guided by the Spirit back then. Devotional readings are free association guided by the Spirit that is meaningful to you. Can you share a devotional reading? Absolutely. But you share it as a testimony, not as the Word of God. You see, your devotional reading is not the word of God for anybody else. It's the word of God for you. Exegesis gives the possibility that you'll have a word of God for everybody else. So it's not right and wrong, devotional reading and exegetical reading. The Holy Spirit's involved in both processes. But when the church is divided, everybody needs to be looking at the same text. Any comments or questions? If not, let's go on to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 1 to 6. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Thank you. All right. So Paul is saying we have this ministry, but we don't lose heart. Apparently, Paul wasn't this kind of person that just persecution, everything just went right over his head. He felt his isolation. He felt the lashes when he received them. He felt the fear. That would come in the presence of intimidating power, etc. But he says, we do not lose heart. Rather, we've renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. So for Paul, it was very, very critical. The word of God was his rock. The word of God was the place that he could go to to find security. And he contrasts, notice in verse 2, We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. The English Standard Version translates that cunning. We do not use cunning, but rather we lay out the word of God. Cunning is when somebody uses great intelligence to sway people, perhaps in a direction that isn't entirely truthful or isn't entirely in their best interests. So cunning. It's kind of like spin, you know, the spin doctor. Cunning is when you take the facts and you put them together in a way that maybe other people would not do. Cunning produces power over other people. Cunning can produce popularity. You know, you frame things in a way that's very exciting to people. You meet their expectations, etc. Paul says, I don't go there. 
The gospel doesn't result in popularity. The gospel doesn't necessarily sway large numbers of people. The gospel is simply the truth of God's word and God's revelation. And the majority of people have always rejected it. And Paul tries to explain that in verses three and four. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of believers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So basically, Paul is saying the reason a lot of people don't come to the gospel is Satan has blinded their minds. So the question I have for you is, how does Satan blind people's minds? This seems like a really important concept. How does he blind people's minds? That for Paul was the big challenge. Can you and I blind people's minds? How do we do that? All right. At heart, Satan is a liar. That's how he defrauded Eve and Adam, by lying to them. And that's, I think, at the heart of it. It's temporary gain. And if I'm trying to defraud somebody, cheat them, steal from them, and so forth, at heart, I'm lying, and particularly to myself, that this is okay. And it's easy to fall into that trap. It's one of those things you have to be on guard for it all the time. You know? So he blinds you by giving you too many options. Okay, good. Appreciate the point. Yeah, Lou? He has so many tools in his arsenal, and he knows human nature really well. And sometimes it's just keeping us so busy that we just don't tune in and connect my heart with God's heart for the day. And sometimes it's just too busy doing good things. So he has so many ways. All right. Thank you. Dan? I think that the idea of being blinded, we can give examples every day. And and in fact, I would say that almost everything that we can talk about, if you believe in relativism, it's all along a various scale. It seems to me that we all suffer to some degree from that, unless we can anchor our ideas on something that we think is reliable. Most of us, well, most of the world, I think today, doesn't have an anchor. And so a relativistic viewpoint on life is quite appropriate. But I think those of us who believe in absolutes or in an absolute God or this absolute truth, I think really have a great advantage and a great benefit because I think people who live in this relativistic world really live in a very insecure existence because they don't really know what's valuable in life. So I think Satan has been very clever in taking most people away from an anchor that could be and should be the basis for their existence. Well, I think you're supporting what Michael was saying a bit earlier. This blizzard of options just leaves us confused and almost helpless in trying to make sense of it all. All right, Ashley? Your question reminded me about if any of you have ever read Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. It's just a really interesting take because it's from the perspective of the devils. And it's about this uncle who's coaching his nephew and all the clever ways they kind of just below consciousness, sort of like influencing things. And there's so many different clever ways that they bring about how we may be getting too comfortable or going through the motions, but we're sort of not actively thinking about what we're doing and how you can be doing all the right things. But if your head's not in the right, anyway, it's just a very eye-opening book if anyone wants like a good read, but it kind of addresses a lot of this. Yeah. I remember reading through it and being like, oh my goodness, you can be in church and be participating. But if you're not actually like thinking, it can have all these consequences. Maybe heart's not in the right place or you're not aware of what you're actually doing. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> right when I saw that put into a form of a play, I think the author was Max McLean or something. And he rewrote screw tape letters into a play where you have, you know, characters going back and forth. Yeah. Let me bring a little bit of science in here that may be relevant. We had a speaker, actually an Israeli, who came to Loma Linda a few years ago to talk about this very issue of how to get students to learn and what's really going on in their heads when they're sitting in class, which often isn't what you think it is. But he made two points that I think were really powerful in this regard. One is 
that human beings have a limited capacity. Maybe that won't be the case in eternity. But right now, we have a limited capacity. We can only handle so much information at a time. So the blizzard that some of you have been talking about of, of information coming at us tends to shut down minds more than it opens them up. So human beings have a limited capacity, and a companion to that is selective attention. Since you don't have the capacity to track on everything all at once, you develop the ability to pick one or two things out of the crowd and focus on that. And of course, if you're a student in a class and you're not focusing on what the teacher is saying, then that's a problem. But human beings have this natural tendency because of limited capacity to be very selective in attention and sometimes not even control of that selectivity. So when we are facing the world, unless we are grounded in the scriptures, God's point of view on almost any issue is going to be one among a multitude of options. And in that context, we may well drift to the wrong thing, thinking that it is the right thing. Ellen White puts it in an interesting way. This is in volume six of the Bible Commentary, page 854. Satan's principal work is to blind or darken men's minds. He does this by keeping them from the study of God's word, by deranging the powers of the mind through excesses of body and soul, by wholly occupying the mind through the things of this life, and by appealing to pride and self-exaltation. So. We live in a world where the distractions have increased exponentially, but our brain capacity has not, is not able to expand to meet the challenge. So what Ellen White saw as a big issue in the 19th century, I think is 10 times more challenging today. Now, let me circle back to you, Larry. In the context of this conversation, have we addressed the issue that you were raising, or would you like to rephrase it and make sure we cover that? The question is, and I'm going to start it off by making a premise that the statement is that I believe the statement to be correct, that mankind was Christ's crowning achievement of his creative power. And that was from, I have to look it up here, but it was in one of the devotional writings. That would indicate, because we often go about how Lucifer was the greatest angel, and since they were created beings, and we are created beings, and if mankind is the crowning achievement of that creative power, it would indicate that there is the capacity to be beyond what the angels. And I'm not suggesting that yeah. we come anywhere close to that. But and in understanding that in terms of what it means of the great controversy of understanding this between good and evil and some of the things that are going on here. Yeah, I do raise the possibility that the limited capacity is due to sin and that the capacity will be much greater later on. The biblical basis for the statement you've made is in Hebrews chapter 2, where the author says that human beings were created for a time lower than the angels, but that in eternity it's not the angels that will rule the universe, but human beings. In other words, for a time below the angels intended ultimately to be above the angels. And human beings are more like God than any other creation for a couple of reasons. One, no angel is ever said to be in the image of God. And number two, no angel has been said to be able to procreate, to create little people like themselves. So human beings are given at least two gifts that are not present among the angels. And so that would suggest that God has a unique and special purpose for the human race. With our limited capacity today, here's the encouraging piece. By exercise, muscles grow stronger. By exercise, intellectually, minds grow stronger. And when you're battling with limited capacity, selective attention, and all of that, and you learn something, you have developed a skill that will be exponential in eternity when you don't have the limitations that you have now. So God can use this miserable period of human existence to train, strengthen, develop us in a way that will have amazing usefulness in eternity. All right, so in 2 Corinthians 4, then, 
He speaks to the Word of God as the focus for our limited attention. And following the Word is not always easy, but we get a lot more than we lose by our investment in it. Question number three, why were early reformers like Luther and Tyndale so anxious to translate the Bible into the common languages of their communities? And I think the answer to that is to let the Holy Spirit work directly with the people. The Holy Spirit is combined with the Word of God. And as a result, when we have the Word of God, the Holy Spirit can work with us in a way that maybe couldn't otherwise. And so the reformers were deeply motivated to translate the Bible in the languages that the Holy Spirit could work directly with the people. I do note that it seems the more accessible the Bible is, the less we value it. And that's kind of human as well. So coming to the last question there, does the work we do for God matter if we never see any results? And the example the lesson gives is Tyndale. Tyndale was one of the reformers in England in the 1530s, around the time Luther was at his peak. And Tyndale's great burden was to translate the Bible into the English language. Wycliffe's translation by then was already a couple hundred years old and was difficult to read and understand. Around the day that Tyndale completed his translation and got it out of the country so that people in Germany could actually print and produce it, he was put to the stake and killed. Tyndale himself never saw the results. And so it raised the question in my mind, does the work of God matter if we don't see the results. As time and again, you and I may do works for the Lord and don't see any result. Does that matter? Sean? The question that comes to my mind immediately is, what results are we looking for? I have the great joy. I'm going to cover two issues here, one that we just discussed. I have the great joy of working with a crowd of people very few people work with and translating into intelligible understanding in their way of thinking and in their language, some of the values that I have and I hold. I have a tremendous joy in being able to do that. Now back to the results. When I look at this group, when I engage with this group, what results am I looking for? And I have found it the greatest comfort of all to not look for any results at all, to not establish any expectations in terms of behavior, that they're going to change the way they express themselves, that they're going to clean up their act, et cetera, et cetera. And that really does provide for me a rather good reference point because I do see over the years that I've enjoyed working with some of these folks, I have seen some major changes in the way they do express themselves in some of the disciplines that they enact when they're in a different crowd that doesn't really want to hear a bunch of foul language. Some of these folks are actually able to discipline. So the question was, what results are we looking for? What are the incremental changes that would provide for me a basis for saying, hey, we have success here? Success, of course, is left up to the work of God and the Holy Spirit. But I wanted to combine those two things because it's important to me when I work with other people, if I could put it that way, that my expectations are very, very contained. And basically, the way I contain them is to ask God to make sure that the work is happening in my life, and so that I don't have to expect somebody else to do what I expect them to do. Uh, I'm going to do it myself. So I want to combine those two thoughts. Thank you. All right. Very good. Thank you. Lou? I think it's true. Like Sean says, are we focused on results? Because that can even take my eyes off of Jesus. And if I'm focused on him and my relationship with him, the Holy Spirit will do what needs to be done in somebody else's heart, either through me or without me. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, Michael. There's many, many examples of people who went off to mission fields to spread the word of God, who never received any accolade for doing so. We don't recall their names, et cetera, et cetera. And I think in that regard, the Jesuit missionaries who came from France and went to what is present day upstate New York and and into Canada and so forth, a lot of them lost their lives for doing that. And 
Who are they? We don't know. But did it matter? Yeah, it mattered to God. That's the important thing. It matters to God. And mm -hmm. what are we doing here today together? This is going to be long remembered by the people of the United States or even the members of the Adventist Church or the Catholic Church. Probably not, but it matters to God. And so I think it's significant work and it means something. All right. Yeah, thank you. Ashley? Yeah, I definitely agree. There's a lot of examples of things where people's results didn't come to light until many years after they were gone. But with that said, I still think it's important to at least try to measure your outcomes, <laughs> if at all possible, and be open to feedback. I think that's also part of being responsible with your resources and gifts. So I do think it's important if there are ways to measure <laughs> success to like try to do that. But in many cases, of course, it's easier said than done. So I don't know. There's just a balance there, of course, like with many things. But yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. Tyndale, his last words before he died were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And he said that in 1536, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. That King of England's eyes never opened, but it was 70 years later that the King James Bible was put together with the full authority of the king of that time. And amazingly enough, about 80% of the King James Bible was Tyndale's translation. Tyndale never knew about that. He never understood that. But he had a huge impact. I mean, King James Bible is still about as widely read as any translation today. And it's mostly Tyndale's work. But he never knew that. He had no idea. And so I don't think it's the size of what we do that matters. It's amazing how little decisions can make a huge difference. Let me tell you about a mother who, in her first marriage, had a baby. And the baby died shortly after birth. We don't know how long, but shortly after birth. And then her husband died and she married again. And this woman had four children. One died at four days of age, another at six days, another at two years, another at one year. Did not seem to be somebody able to hold a pregnancy or have a kid born strong enough to survive. Today, most people would say, no more kids, just abort. Do you know who? She would have aborted if she had followed that. The child that survived was called Ludwig von Beethoven, who made a massive impact on the musical world. But his siblings and so on didn't make it. I think two of them eventually survived out of eight births from his mother. But the little decision she made to go ahead anyway had a huge impact. No, so you never know. It can be the smallest of decisions. You may never do anything dramatic in this life, but you might have a child or you might have a passing encounter with someone that changes the direction of their life forever. And you'll never know. So I think faithfulness, this is what the reformers would have said. Faithfulness is what counts. And we leave the results with God, as I think most of you were saying. All right. Number four. Early in his university education, Martin Luther discovered a Latin copy of the Bible. Up to that point, he didn't even know the Bible existed, and it transformed his life almost immediately. And let's just read a couple of texts that the lesson offers to us and see what it has to say about the transforming power of God's Word. Start with John 14, 25 and 26. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. So the Christian claim is that the Bible isn't just the words on a page, that the Bible comes with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has transforming power. Not just words, but life transformation comes with the study of the Bible. It's the same Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible that's there when we read. John 16, 12 to 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own. 
but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All right, so the Holy Spirit then guides us into all truth. And God gives us that truth as we are able to bear it. And so the question comes in sometimes, what is the key? Is it the spirit or is it the study? Some people say, I just open myself to the spirit. Other people study like mad without praying. (laughs) And I think the answer there is the Holy Spirit can only work with what you have. The Holy Spirit will use the word that's in your mind when you memorize scripture. The Holy Spirit will use that in order to bring out what needs to happen in your life. But it's only as you fill your mind with the Word of God that the Holy Spirit can use it in a powerful way. So, again, the the principle of investment, I think, is significant there. Now, the very heart of the Reformation, part five, was centered in the biblical concept of righteousness by faith. And let me take you to the text that some called the most holy place of the Reformation, and that's Romans chapter 3. And let's walk through this text just a little bit. And this is what changed everything, I think, for Luther and the Reformers. Romans 3 and verse 23. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right. So you have there a summary of the human condition. It basically says all have sinned, all right? That's a past tense. It's an aorist in the Greek. That means it's looking at your past as a whole. Your past is complete with sin, all right? So you have a record that is in the past. But it says the second thing, all fall short of the glory of God. And the fall short is a Greek present tense. That means it's continuous. So we have a double problem as sinners. We have a record that we can't get away from. And we are continually falling short of the glory of God. Or to put it another way, you have a record of wrongdoing. And your right doing isn't good enough. And it's continually not good enough. So that was a, I mean, a stunning statement of the human condition. But then comes verse 24. And verse 24 begins with being justified. Being justified. It's a Greek present participle. And for what it's worth, the present participle takes the time of the main verb. Okay, stay with me here. This may be a little thick. But the payoff could be good because it just blew the minds of the reformers and was transforming. The present participle takes its time from the main verb. What's the main verb? Verse 23, all have sinned, all continually fall short. In other words, we are justified. We are freely accepted in our having sinned and in our continually falling short. In other words, the justification that Paul is talking about here covers not only the record of the past. It covers the shortfalls of the present as well. In other words, you are free. You have been accepted by God. You have been justified, whatever you want that to mean. So I think within Adventism, There has been a challenge here is that Adventists have often read this in terms of the past. Justification covers the past. Now you've got to behave. Now it's up to you, which is a subtle form of legalism. You know, well, God covers the past, but now you got to shape up. And that's pretty much the way I read Sabbath school quarterlies when I was younger, pretty much the way I was raised. But that's not what the text says here. The justification is not just for the past. It's also for the present and the future. That when God receives you, he receives you totally. And that was revolutionary to those who were reading it in the time of the Reformation. 
On what basis does God accept us? We are justified freely by his grace. Grace is another word for gift, and so is the word freely. So we're justified freely, freely. We're gifted by a gift. It doubles it up to say, you can't do a thing. You cannot do a thing to earn this. Nothing you do, nothing you say can earn the justification. It is absolutely free. It is in God's heart. It is not something that we have in our hearts or something that we have done. So the first ground of justification is the character of God, the freeness of God. The second is found, we are justified freely by his grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So the second basis for justification is in Christ. And as you know, what happened at the cross has many explanations. But the explanation that has long been preferred in this class is that at the cross, God not only freely received us, but demonstrated that we could have confidence in his character. And then the third part, verse 28, is that we are justified by faith, not by observing the law. So the pathway is this. First of all, justification comes from God's heart, a free gift. Second of all, it comes in a way that meets our need to believe in it. We cannot trust God unless we truly believe that he is what he says he is. You know, by grace is the claim. In Christ is the demonstration. And as a result, we can trust God. Justification comes when we trust God's word, when we trust God's claim that he receives us freely. So this was, I think, the thing that truly broke the back of legalism at the time of the Reformation and energized the Reformers. But the clear message here is salvation is a free gift. But here's the interesting piece. When Ellen White wrote her book on salvation, she never mentions justification by faith. Never mentions it. The very thing that she praises Luther for, she never mentions it in her own book on salvation. So I'm curious why you think a book like Steps to Christ would make no mention at all of this thing that was so central to the Reformation. All right, Sean. I think uh, to the point of what you're asking, but I'm going to ask the same thing of Luther. Did Luther get the in God's heart part equally with through the ransom part? This is something that I think is still being debated and certainly played out in the theological expression of a lot of denominational positions. Mm -hmm. And my question before we get to Ellen White on the matter is, which of these, or both, which of these did Luther understand at the time of that Reformation when that Reformation blew up? I have a sense that the in God's heart part was not as central as through the ransom part. Yeah. Now, Luther was a lawyer. And for Luther, there was the whole issue of how can God freely accept us? That sounds illegal. God had to have a legal basis. Okay. And so for Luther, then the law court interpretation of justification, the acquittal in court, would be grounded on the sacrifice of Jesus and his perfect obedience. You see, there, God has an infinite basis to account us righteous, even though we never did it right ourselves. So for Luther, I think the genius of that is that we have to acknowledge, even if that is only a metaphor, ultimately, but the genius of that is for legalists. They tend to ask this question, how can God, it would be a blasphemy for God to accept me freely. And for that mindset, God provides this legal justification approach that enables them to accept the freeness on God's part. So for Luther, part two, the in Christ, 
would focus on the blood and on the hilasterion, the uh, propitiation or the uh, mercy seat. Uh, yeah, so that it needed some kind of transaction. Not that God didn't want to, but in their minds, but that God needed a, a legal justification, right? That is one metaphor of the atonement, one out of many. But I think in the context of the 16th century, that was probably a necessary approach. And God provided within scripture the possibility to read that way. Yeah. If I may, with a follow up, John. Go ahead. Yeah. I think, now speaking of Ellen White, mm-hmm. I think that is why justification is not mentioned in the little book. She was wrapping up the legal framework into the in God's heart larger framework and focusing on justification was a bit too legal for her understanding at that point and she spoke in terms of this is who God is Mm -hmm. God will do this anyway he regardless of whatever expression happened to take place and it happened to be Christ on the cross God would have done this anyway. So I think the in God's heart part overcame and was the overarching theme for Ellen White and not so much the ransom part or in the in Christ part. Mm -hmm. And we'll let Michael speak to this in just a moment, because I think this became crucial between Protestant and Catholic at the same time, because the challenge with that approach is if you're justified freely, then you're home, you see? But then there's no incentive to obey, no incentive to a stronger life. It's just a, some call it a legal fiction, see? And the Roman Catholics responded very negatively to that at the time and said, no, 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 God, God, there's a real justification. It's a transforming justification, you see? And that has often been characterized as a new legalism, and for many it probably was, okay? But it was inherent in the metaphor that you're going to have this challenge. So the Catholic says justification is an active thing. It is a transforming justification. Luther said, no, it's just a declaration. And so you had that challenge. But the reality is, as we all know, if you read the New Testament, God gives freely at the same time, Jesus becomes Lord, doesn't he? So when you're freely accepted by God, Jesus becomes your Lord, and that means he can tell you what to do. So a metaphor, a legal metaphor, falls short to really grasp the whole of that transaction. And that's the beauty of the healing metaphor that Graham Maxwell and others have used. And the healing metaphor combines the two, that the obedience and the freeness all come together in one package. It would be stupid not to obey the doctor when the doctor has the means to cure you and you have an incurable disease. You see, it would be foolishness not to obey. It's not the obedience that saves you. It's the doctor who saves you. But unless you obey the doctor, you're not going to get the results that you need. So that metaphor, again, is probably not a perfect one. But it eases the tension, you know, the Catholic Protestant tension there of exactly how human works fit into this legal process. Anyway, Michael, I may have gotten that all wrong, but I'm looking to you for quality control. No, no, no. This has been great. It really is. One of the problems that not Luther faced, but what happened after Luther, remember, Germany was not a unified country. There was a bunch of princes all over Germany, and a lot of them liked the idea I'm saved by faith. I can go out and commit all kinds of things. And then because I have faith in Jesus Christ, I'll be saved. And in fact, Luther himself, he didn't like the epistle of James, which says faith without words is dead. The other thing is Luther with his 95 theses, what he was really upset about was selling indulgences in order to build Basilica St. Peter's by Pope Julius in Rome. And the Catholic Church has kind of softened its approach as far as Luther is concerned. And today, I think if such a thing had happened today, they wouldn't have excommunicated him. They would have said, let's talk about this issue. Maybe this was all part of God's plan. 
Luther was a tortured soul. He was an Augustinian priest, which is a tough sell in and of itself. And <laughs> he'd have his confession heard, and it would go on for hours. He would say, I picked up a piece of paper, and I started to write on it. I realized it wasn't mine. He wanted to confess that sin. And so when he found this passage in Romans, it was a godsend to him. Mm -hmm. It relieved him of all this sense of guilt that had been carried around for years. And mm -hmm. I think that Luther, in my view, is an example of how God works with people to accomplish what God wants done. Because it was not only fathered the Reformation, but it proved to be an awakening moment for the Catholic Church. And it took a long time for the Catholic Church to finally come around and say, you know, Luther was right about a lot of these things. It took the Second Vatican Council. You know, what's 400 years among friends? <laughs> for God, not much. <laughs> Less than a day, maybe about six hours right, for God. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. If God can use Balaam's donkey, he can use almost anybody. And I do think, as you say, I like the way you put it, tortured soul. I think most people reading it today would worry about such an individual at times. But for him, the message as it came to him was necessary. He would never have accepted the free grace of God without some condition. And so this legal metaphor provided what he needed. And, you know, as we read from Ellen White previously, God gave the reformers a little at a time as they were able to bear it. And God will do that with us, too. So that's encouraging. Lou. Well, when it comes to the words and the terms justification and sanctification, I really love Graham Maxwell's very simple. The justification is being set right and sanctification is being kept right. To me, that just takes all the confusion out of it. And it's just very simple and very beautiful. It just helped me a lot when I got that concept. All right, let's go on to number eight. We're running short on time, and this is one I did not want to leave out. Number eight, because we're talking about now the Reformation, and the Reformation cast a lot of shade over the medieval church, okay? And Seventh-day Adventists often echo that perspective. Uh, so I write here, many or most historical accounts of the medieval church, including Catholic accounts, are extremely negative criticizing unbiblical doctrines, persecution of those who disagreed, withholding access to the Bible for most believers. Michael mentions the indulgences, the shadow that casts on God's character, that God would simply, you know, a rich person emptying pocket change gets God's favor. The poor person who doesn't have any pocket change is out of luck, etc. The picture of God that comes out of that is tragic. So there are real issues here. But we have often made the case in this class that the cosmic conflict implies that God is at work in every time, in every place, in every religion. Satan also at work. And we often talk about Satan's work when it's somebody else. <laughs> And we see that very clearly. Uh, we may not see him working in our neighborhood nearly as well. But here's the question I want you to ponder a bit. If God is at work in every religion, where was God working in the Middle Ages? We've talked about some of the dark side. Where was God working in the Middle Ages? If the history of the papacy is so negative, why did God let the papacy win the battle for control of the church? Keep in mind, there were five or six versions of Christianity in the early centuries. Constantine kind of put the kibosh on the rest of them. And only Christian Orthodoxy survived in the form of the Roman Catholic Church and then also the Eastern Orthodox Church after a few hundred years. So why did God allow a situation like that if it was so terrible? In other words, what was God doing? Where's the positive? God must have had something to go this route. And some of you have kind of hinted at this. You know, God has amazing ways to work in what we don't think he could possibly be working with. So just to think about this change, instead of saying what's wrong with it, what was right? What was God doing there? 
in allowing things to take the course they did a thousand years that some call the dark ages now. Michael. Well, in some of those periods were some really great people. For example, there was Thomas Aquinas, the great philosopher who developed the proofs of the existence of God, which are hard to refute. The notion of the uncaused cause, how that necessarily leads you to God does exist and then wrote about the attributes of God. And in essence, that God is love and God loves everyone. Every Or Francis of Assisi was... Amazing human being. Yes, absolutely stunning what he did. So it wasn't all terrible. Unfortunately, the dark part, the dark ages were really dark. People were uneducated. There were very few educated people. People didn't read anymore. It was just terrible what happened. But with the Renaissance, which is the Italian term for rebirth, it also spawned the Reformation. So anyway, it wasn't all bad, is what I'm getting. Thank you. Yes, that's directly answering my question. Dan? I would suggest that God was quite active, actually. In the Christian world, we have Ireland and Patrick, who created the Celtic Church, which again brought a more primitive type of religion back to Europe. We have the Nestorian churches going into China. And I think within other churches, we have various reform movements within Hinduism that occurred about at that time because of people from the steppes challenging the Hindu religion. And so I think that when one sort of looks historically at the Dark Ages, there was a period of almost general revival throughout the whole world in mm -hmm. about um, six, seven, eight hundred 800 AD. And so I don't think we talked about some of these other movements. We sort of concentrate just on the Christian world. But there were things happening throughout the world at that time. And so as I've read about some of these kind of things, I've been encouraged that God was working everywhere to the extent that people were receptive to his callings. And he was working, I believe, in every church in all ways. If you think about China during this time, Buddhism entered China, and we might look down on Buddhism, but it certainly was better than whatever else the Chinese had at that time. So that I think if one looks globally, I think God was quite active in helping people to improve their vision of how to live. Thank you. Uh, it sounds like a lot of stuff there we want to look into more deeply sometime in the future. Yeah, Bob, and then we need to draw a close. God seems to work on a different time frame than we do, like the children of Israel going 40 years in the wilderness when you could walk from Egypt to Palestine in a few days. And it seems like with this too, like Michael said earlier, what's 400 years among friends? But it just seems like God is in much less of a hurry than we are. And for some reason, maybe in the hereafter, we'll probably get some classes. We'll explain why it had to take so long. And then it seems like God suddenly had the printing press invented, which seemed to suddenly spawn all of this progress. But why didn't he have the printing press invented about a thousand years earlier? I don't know. But it does seem like he has such a different time frame than we do because we're in a much more of a hurry. But I'll leave it there because I don't have any more answers than that. <laughs> awesome. Yes. If you ask the question of great controversy, it mentions Ireland, it mentions Czech Republic. You had a number of characters there well before Luther, Comenius, as well as Huss and Jerome. It mentions the Waldenses, a group that was hiding in the Alps and so on. So it focuses more on the fringe groups. But asking the larger picture, why did God let the papacy win if it was such a detriment to the church at many points in history? I think the answer is this, because the church got the most important thing right. God was willing to put up with a lot of negatives to get the most important thing right. And what was the most important thing? It was the canon of the New Testament. There were five or six Christian groups in the early centuries, and they had all kinds of different canons. One of them was as small as 11 books, just one of the Gospels and 10 of Paul's letters. That was it. The one of Montanus was like, oh, everybody who has the Spirit is as inspired as the Apostles. So we're all Bibles. You know? So you had the two extremes. 
And what in the end happened was the New Testament was broad. It had a variety of perspectives in it, but it was also limited. It wasn't like any old idea could get in there. So you get the canon right, and reformation is always possible. You get the canon right, and the character of God can be clarified later on. If the canon is off, then we're all kind of lost. So the church, the early church, got the most important thing right. And if any of the other branches of the church had won that battle, you know, under Constantine, we would have a very different Bible and a very different church today. I mentioned Giotto's Sistine Chapel. My wife and I got to visit that near Venice not long ago. Incredible pictures of the Bible in there. 1300, well before the Reformation, beautiful pictures of the Bible telling amazing stories and so on. Most people in the world know of the cross because of the Roman Catholic Church. And the crosses are everywhere in <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church. So God can use Balaam's donkey, right? And it doesn't matter how God chooses to do it, but he worked things the way that he worked them for his ultimate purpose. Let me share with you a few statements from Ellen White as we close related to this. Great Controversy, page 143. There was a present truth in the days of Luther, a truth at that time of special importance. There is a present truth for the church today. In other words, all of God's movements have had limited capacity, selective attention. But God encourages us in the direction of the truth that will have the biggest impact today. And I believe that God used the Adventist church in a similar way to provide some truths to the world that would not have come any other way. And perhaps God raised up the Adventist church to get one thing right. And in your pure minds over the next week, you can think about what might that one thing be, the most important thing. But I'll leave that thought. Evangelism, page 574, there should be no going out of the way to attack other denominations, for it only creates a combative spirit and closes ears and hearts to the entrance of the truth. Yes, she said many things that can seem harsh. As we mentioned, they come in a context uh, in which that kind of speech was acceptable in public, but she herself offers correctives later on. And finally, 575, we should not go out of our way to make hard thrusts at the Catholics. Among the Catholics, there are many who are most conscientious Christians and who walk in all the light that shines on them, and God will work in their behalf. It's a very easy thing to look at the best in your religion and the worst in someone else's and say, look, I'm better than you. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. But is that what we see Jesus doing when he walked on this earth? Or did Jesus weep hot tears for the very ones who rejected him? Father, forgive them. They don't really understand what they're doing. You know? So as we go through these important lessons, as we weigh truth versus error and how that applies to us today, we remember the greatest truth is God's character, and the greatest truth we can live by is to be as much like God as we possibly can. And by God's grace, may that be found in us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we have wrestled with some challenging topics in the last few lessons. I'm grateful to you that you've been with us, that in the conversations we've corrected one another, we have amplified, we have expanded, and I believe we have all learned something, and we're grateful for it. So I pray, Lord, that in the week to come, you would be with us, and as we move forward into fresh understanding of Christian history, that you would walk with us through all of that and help us to keep in mind that the ultimate issue is who you are. And we look forward to the day when everyone will know. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.